Welcome back. I trust you're being well fed in many ways. <laughs> I have a couple of announcements to make. One is that a person has lost their keys. So if you found someone's keys, please bring them to me sometime before the end of the day. Another um, announcement from your sponsor, New College Berkeley, is we would love to have you fill out these response forms and just leave them on the table in the narthex after doing so. And please take a program flyer for New College Berkeley. We have a lot of upcoming programs that we would love to see you at. Uh, someone today said she didn't realize we'd been doing this real faith film series now. I think we've been doing it for about a dozen years. And it's a fabulous um, opportunity to spend Friday evenings this summer in August watching a film with other Christians and then having a conversation facilitated by, often it's a pastor on the First Press Berkeley staff and faculty at New College Berkeley and Sharon Gallagher curates the series. There's no charge, you're very welcome to come. So look on our website to see what films will be shown and please join us. Also, our spiritual direction groups and the Ignatian Spiritual Exercises group will begin in September, but we start interviewing and enrolling now. So please be in touch with us about that. After all the years of program we've done at New College, now over 40 years, we've come to think of these groups as the most spiritually formative uh, engagement that mature Christians can undertake. So I'd encourage you to consider that and we have GTU credit courses. We have faith and work forums, which are primarily for the university community, but other people are welcome as well. And we have contemplative retreats during the year. And then the new program that First Press Berkeley and New College Berkeley are offering is this once a year Berkeley Palmer lecture. And this one is gonna be on May 5th. There's material about it in the narthex. And you're invited to come as our guest to hear Dr. Craig Barnes, president of Princeton Theological Seminary. Earl and Shirley will be there. And um, you're also welcome to participate in endowing that lectureship. So it can go on and on beyond uh, all of us who are here. So uh, with, with those things being said, please now welcome again, Reverend Earl Palmer. All right, we wanna do one more sounding now. Uh, there's this long stretch of the Gospel of John that is, it contains dialogue and, and events that occur from Feast of Tabernacles right straight through. The, uh, let's just once again see all those things that happen then after Feast of Tabernacles. You get that great parable that's taught in the, in the 10th chapter of John where he calls himself the good shepherd who doesn't lose track of his sheep. And that nothing, no one can snatch you out of my hand. It's a wonderful uh, set of promises. And then, and then of course, the, the whole se uh, sequence concerning the raising of Lazarus. And I gave you a little, some hints of how important that was. And how, of course, uh, because of John, we get this a profounder understanding of Martha. So that you need Martha and Mary. And I love those two characters. But be sure you you see the Johannine account to put it alongside of the Luke account in Luke 10 when, when uh, Martha seems like she's just cranky uh, toward Mary. But you have that wonderful, tender scene of, of, 
Uh, by the way, Martha comes out strong even in that Lazarus the King. Jesus says, you know, uh, where is he? Uh, where is the body? Because he wanted to raise Lazarus. And she said, well, the body will be smelly now. She is, it's Martha, <laughs> practical Martha says now it's going to be a smelly body to have. So be careful. He says, no, just uh, 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 where? And then so she gives instructions to the servants as to where. And then Jesus uh, raises Lazarus. This amazing scene, this uh, baffling scene. And, uh, uh, and, the, and then, of course, John's the one who makes the comment that one of the reasons for the great crowd of people that came on Palm Sunday was because of, of uh, the rumor about the raising of Lazarus. <clears throat> So at any rate, then the entry into the city and what we call the great, the week like no other week, Holy Week. Now, we get a lot of help, though, from the other Gospels about that Holy Week. For instance, Matthew gives us a lot of material of what happens from Palm Sunday up through to Thursday. And then, of course, Friday. Uh, th that we owe a lot. I don't want to say I'm not. I hope you don't think I'm downgrading the importance of Matthew, Mark and Luke. They give us great evidence about what happens during those days of Holy Week. But then, uh, then comes this long dialogue section that happens uh, on the night of the Lord's Supper, on the Thursday night. We call it the Thursday night discourse. And that goes from chapter 13, 14, all the way through to 16, and then the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's interesting, Jesus does not teach the Our Father prayer in the book of John like he does in Matthew, but we get this great high priestly prayer of Jesus in which he prays for the disciples and prays that God will not take us out of the world, but will keep us in the world and give us a ministry in the world. And that's the 17th chapter of John. And then you go from 18th, then the 18th on is his betrayal his trial, uh, first at the house of, of Annas, the, the father-in-law of the high priest, and then Caiaphas, then the encounter with, with Pontius Pilate. And uh, by the way, one of my favorite Dorothy Sayers treatments of the life of Christ is man born to be king. Have, are any of you aware of that great uh, play, that, the radio play that Dorothy Sayers wrote, Man Born to be King? It was produced uh, during World War II in, in the Battle of Britain. Uh, you know, the, the BBC uh, got two people to come and help uh, during the Battle of Britain, those dark hours and days from 1941 on. The United States was not yet in the war. We were in the war in December of 41. But you've got to realize that end of, of 1940 and all through 1941 was dark and dangerous days. All of Europe has fallen really to the Nazis. And now England stands exposed. And during that time, BBC invited C.S. Lewis and Dorothy Sayers, two people, they knew each other, to play a role for, to cheer up the people. And so Lewis was invited to give broadcast talks. They became the book, Mere Christianity, is the broadcast talks that Lewis gave, uh, 29 talks that he gave during that dark time. Actually, he ended up giving talks all the way through to 1944. And then in 1941, Dorothy Sayers, starting at the, in December of 40, all the way through October of 41, Dorothy Sayers had a group of actors, 43 of them, and they did a performance every month on BBC, a radio broadcast performance, and she wrote an original script for it called Man Born to be King. By the way, if you're a Karl Barth fan like I am, Karl Barth, you know, he never makes any mention of C.S. Lewis at all because I don't think Barth approved of Lewis because Lewis uh, did flirt with natural theology. <laughs> and uh, that's okay because I think a little natural theology is not bad for all of us. But... Uh, but uh, Bart did not like that. So, but he loved Dorothy Sayers. And in his dogmatics and outline, he made, pays tribute to Dorothy Sayers' Man Born to be King as a tremendous portrayal of the life of Christ from Dorothy Sayers, the, the novelist who translated Dante. I mean, she's a brilliant, brilliant woman. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, she uh, was asked by BBC 
first they asked her to do it for the children's hour on BBC, thinking a story about the life of Christ would be nice for children's hour, until they saw her script. And her script was very earthy. She used Cockney English. She didn't use these and thous. And she, used, and she wanted modern English type actors to be in it. And, uh, and they, uh, the, the, the BBC uh, Children's Hour director said, yeah, we can do it if you let us edit it. And Dorothy Sayers took the contract that they had given her and she tore it in little tiny pieces and put it in an envelope and sent it back and said, I cancel the contract. Nobody can edit anything I write. And <laughs> Dorothy Sayers, a little bit like Tolkien, nobody touches anything Tolkien writes. And nothing, nobody touches what I write. And so they were quite upset. So then fortunately, BBC took it out of Children's Hour and turned it over to a director who wasn't even a Christian, Val Gilgan. Val Gilgan is the brother of Sir John Gilgan, probably the most famous actor in England. And his brother, Val Gilgan, was the head of adult programming for BBC. He took it over. He could handle Dorothy Sayers because Dorothy Sayers showed up at every rehearsal. I mean, she was quite a lady, a Martha, if there ever was a Martha. And she shows up and she wrote this and nobody touched it. Do you know the first condemnation of what man born to became came from the Presbyterian church? They said it was irreligious and, and maybe even sacrilegious. But fortunately, they did not win out. And uh, that was the Church of Scotland. They didn't win out and uh, it went ahead. And when it was broadcast, they apologized and said, we were wrong. This is a great piece of work. But anyway, she did this wonderful man born to be king. But do you know how she handles Pontius Pilate? There's a great moment in Pontius Pilate. One of the gospel records tells us that when Pontius Pilate was judging Jesus, his wife sent a message to him and said, have nothing to do with that man. I have had a bad dream about that man. And Dorothy Sayers, being a novelist, gets to write Man Born to be King. And being a novelist, she can tell what the dream was. And so anyway, in her, in, if you read Man Born to be King, when Pilate gets this note from his wife right during the trial, he says, I'll look at that later. And then he does the trial. And finally, he looks at her note after he has condemned Jesus to the, the cross. And the, the, the note is from his wife. says, I've had a bad dream about that man. I have dreamt that we were in this great place and there were thousands and thousands of people and they were all talking and they were all talking and we couldn't stop them talking. And they would say, and they were saying, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. <laughs> and they will say that for all time. But it was too late. Pilate had already condemned him to death. Isn't that, that's Dorothy Sayers. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's in the creed. Pontius Pilate gets his name in the creed. And Dorothy Sayers said that was the bad dream that Pilate's wife had. I have had a bad dream about this man. I've heard thousands and thousands of people. And all they're saying is he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Isn't that, does that give you goosebumps? Well, that's Dorothy Sayers and that's man born to be king. And uh, Jesus did face that trial. But I want to do now a sounding in the Thursday night discourse. And that would be in John, the 15th chapter, uh, where Jesus is with his disciples and giving them uh, probably the, the most important advice uh, they, they got from Jesus in terms of our ministry. And really, actually, do you know that uh, this is orig not original here, uh, what uh, Jesus has what he has said here has already been reported for us in Matthew. In Matthew, in 20, uh, Matthew 22, during Holy Week, uh, the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and, and had gathered together. And then one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him, again, to tempt him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with the, all your mind. 
This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22. The amazing sentence of our Lord during Holy Week. In, in answer to a trick question. Because, you know, they, they were very much upset about how he handled the law, especially the law of the Sabbath observance. Is that the greatest law? And then what is the greatest law? And notice our Lord doesn't really answer it, but he answers the soul of the law. The greatest law is this. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God, which, by the way, is the way the Jewish Seder service begins. The Seder service begins in Deuteronomy uh, hear, O Israel, there is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and, and strength. And then, then the second one Jesus adds to it is the Levitical law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. So uh, that is the great commandment. And our Lord then works with that commandment with his disciples actually in the Thursday night discourse. So take chapter 15 and we'll look at chapter 15 uh, where he now explains that commandment as I see it. As the Father has loved me, this is now verse 9, so I have loved you. Now you abide in my love. You know, that means make your, make your dwelling in my love. That's the, to be the base for where you're going to make your life. Uh, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you. Notice, our Lord is saying, because he knows that he's already made this statement, Jesus has already made this statement in answer to the, the, the trick question, what is the great commandment, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and the neighbor as yourself. And on this, all the law hangs. Everything hangs. It's a little bit like after that woman caught, caught in adultery and Jesus, you might say, outwits that crowd. Have you ever thought of the fact that Jesus protected the crowd from committing murder? He protected the crowd from blasphemy by saying, he who's without sin, you cast the first stone. And they all left from oldest to youngest. He protected them, and then he protected this woman. Have you ever thought of that? Jesus protects everybody when he is the Redeemer, and the Redeemer is able to do that, and he fulfills the law. See, everything, all the law and the prophets are now fulfilled, and that makes the sense of that next line. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. You're worried about whether you're going to obey the law in Leviticus or something? You follow this and you will do everything. By the way, that's very important in remembering political promises and political aspirations. Uh, we as a believer, uh, we treasure our country and treasure uh, things about our country, but we get meaning for our life from the great law. And the great law is not how you stand on this issue or that issue necessarily. And uh, it is... Uh, whether you love the Lord your God with all your soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You cannot separate the two. They're put together. On these two, everything hangs. That has a, a, very, big, a very big part to play in how you retreat uh, the, the sojourner in your, in your midst. Because remember, the other trick question was, and oh, by the way, Lord, who's my neighbor? <laughs> and Jesus then tells the, the stories parables to show who the neighbor is and the neighbor is the one who fell among thieves and they, it has nothing to do with nationality it's, my neighbor is the one that God gives me in front of my path and so uh, it gives you a, a great freeing in fact our Lord then goes on to say in the text we looked at this morning and you will know the truth and when you, don't, when you obey this you'll have freedom you'll be given freedom when you obey this great commandment. So that's then. Now notice here in the Thursday night discourse, he's repeating this again. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. This is not bad news. This is good news. It's good news to have this liberating uh, ability to love others and to love the neighbor as ourselves. And then he goes on. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this. Now notice he's making the source of that love his sacrificial love in our behalf, which fulfills Feasts of Tabernacles. That is the sacrifices. I am the one that makes it possible for you to have this love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You're my, you're my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. By the way, you know the word for friend here is comrade. I've called you comrades. You know, I love that word in the Greek because our Lord in Matthew, when he told the parable of the all-day workers, remember he paid the, uh, the workers the same wage that worked the 11th hour, got the same wage as the guys that worked all day long? And one of the all-day-long workers came up to, in this parable, come up to, Jesus, to come up to the owner and say, hey, you know, we suffered the heat of the day, and you gave these the same wage you gave us. You know, of course, he, he ignores the fact that the poor guys that waited all day didn't know how they were going to feed their family that night. The guys that worked all day in the sweat of the day did get to know how they were going to feed their family because they got hired. What's worse, to work hard or to be unemployed? <laughs> you know, that, that's the great sadness right now in so much of the world, people that can't get a, a job. And to be unemployed is worse. Anybody will tell you that. I'd rather work hard all day in the heat than be unemployed. But notice they ignored that. They said, we, we suffered the heat of the day. And then you went out at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and said, why are you guys still here? Well, no one hired us. Well, you go work. I'll pay you what's fair. He doesn't say what he'll pay him. I'll pay you what's fair. And then in the end of the day, he pays them all the same wage. And then the all-day workers come up and say, why have you done this? We have suffered. The and do you know what the Lord says? Our Lord has the, the owner say to him. He says, comrade, same word as friend, comrade, I did you no wrong. Don't have a bent eye. <laughs> Don't have a distorted eye. Look at it my way. See it the way I see it. In other words, you, you had a job all day. They didn't. So don't have a bent eye. That's exactly the, the literal text. But he calls them comrade. He doesn't say, you ungrateful workers. I'm going to fire you. No. No, what he does is say, comrade, why don't you join management next time? You'll be helping me do the, the hiring, and you can set wages. I'm calling you a comrade. Comrade, I did no wrong. Don't begrudge me my generosity. That's what the Lord puts in the parable. Let me be who I am. I am generous. Grace. Grace is the big law. On this, all the laws depend. And so notice, comrade. That's, now, the same word used here. Uh, lay down his life for one's friends. You're my friends, my comrades. If you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. It's almost like in Matthew, the parable of the all day workers. Don't begrudge me my generosity. I learned that from the father. And now I'm giving it to you. So say, comrades, I have everything I have known to you, I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would last. So the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. That paragraph is a kind of an interesting uh, parable, and it's if from a poet's standpoint. I like to think of myself as a poet sometimes. I like to think of what is what is a, what imagery is used and combined in the poem. The poem, and, and and so in poems, you're very interested in what is the first line of a poem, maybe the last line of a poem, and that is true in this paragraph. The paragraph begins and ends with the same 
set of words. We'll look at that in just a minute. But notice what he's doing in this, uh, in this wonderful text. In this text, Jesus is giving to his disciples. And this is in Holy Week on Thursday night before he goes to the cross. He's giving to the disciples two proofs, or uh, two sets of proofs of their friendship with him. He's giving proofs of the promise of their friendship. And it's really quite moving when you think of it. The first proof is from his side. And that is, and then there are, the first set of proofs are from his side, and the second set of proofs are from our side that shows how we know we're a friend of, of Jesus Christ, a friend of the Lord, and uh, our, our kite flying instead of a, a rebellious kite not trying to do its own way. But at any rate, the first promise of friendship that he tells us of is the most ancient of all proofs of friendship, and that is... Uh, it's what someone would do for you to help you, what they would do for you. And what, not just what they say, but what they would do. And notice he starts with this. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend, his comrade. And that's the first proof of the friendship, is Jesus Christ laying his own life down in our behalf. And that gets ready for what's going to happen on Good Friday. He is laying his life down, and that's the first proof of the friendship. So in other words, you think of it, we even think of it crudely sometimes in our own lives, that we think of a friend is somebody that you could count on that would help you if you were in distress. And uh, who could you really look for for help in a time of stress? Uh, that's a friend. That, that, that separates friends from acquaintances often. Uh, you know, I made a joke about it once I, when I was preaching on this, I think in Seattle, because I had joined uh, Rotary Number 4 in Seattle. When I was in Berkeley, I was in Rotary here too. But I said, you know, you get a roster in Rotary, and then to make it, to show you really are a good friend of everybody in Rotary, you not only get a roster, you get a badge, and a great big letter, your first name, Earl, and then Palmer underneath little. But they want it so, so guys can come up, and even though they don't know you, it looks like they know you because with the letter so big, they see, oh, hi, Earl, how you doing? You know, they don't even know you. But you're a Rotarian, and you have a big badge, and you got the first name is really big. I don't like badges where they have your name in small print because you can't then play that game and make it look like you know everybody in the room and work the room. So, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, though. You get a roster of all the Rotarians, and I, and I made a little joke about this. If you were having car trouble and your car is broken down out in the middle of the freeway somewhere, or maybe, or maybe even worse, not even on a freeway, because there you've got AAA maybe, but, but in some little country road and, you, and your car is broken down, who would you call for help? Know how, notice how quickly the acquaintance list would go through. Uh, is there anybody in Rotary number four that I could call? They know my name because I've got the, the guy with the big badge that has Earl. They, everybody else has the same badge. So do I call? And it's, isn't it interesting that your brain is so fast, you would quickly compute somebody that is the kind of person that you could trust to help in a time of great stress. And isn't it funny that that's the first proof that Jesus gives Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. And I'm calling you friends, and that's the proof of the friendship, okay? The proof is what he would do for us. And you know, that we know a lot about that, because we have to think through, who could we call? Who could we have come and help us in a time of great distress? But the second proof is subtle. Notice the second proof that Jesus gives is an expansion of the first, but it's more subtle. He says, I don't call you slaves. I call you comrades. I call you friends. And notice he puts it this way. I call you friends uh, because I have made known to you everything that I've been shown by the Father. In other words, I've taken you into my confidence. I have made you a part of my life. I am sharing my ministry and mystery with you to be a part of it. And so that is the second proof. The, the proof is not only 
um, uh, you might say, heroic, that I, I'm laying my life down for you. But our Lord adds that second one. I am bringing you in on, and that's why I made a joke about that with regard to the all-day workers. When Jesus said to the complaining worker, comrade, I did you no wrong, he's inviting him into management. He said, come and help me make these decisions, then I'll make them better in the future. Or learn to get the job, learn to get your job at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, then you can get the same wage. But no, he didn't. That would be terrible. But anyway, comrade, he takes you into his confidence. And that is the second, you might say, promise of, of his friendship with us. It's not sacrificial in a way. It's a sense of communion and a sense of fellowship with, with, with Christ. It's, it's, it's entering us in the mystery of prayer. Have you ever thought about it that the Hebrew word for prayer, for intercession in the Hebrew Bible, is the word pala in, Greek, in Hebrew, which means literally to think with, to think with God. And, you, you know, that's an interesting way of thinking about prayer. Prayer is not simply to plead with God or to humbly ask from God, but it is to think with God. Remember when Moses thought with God and actually said to God, don't let the children of Israel die out here in the wilderness. You'll get a bad reputation. Moses said that to the Lord. You'll get a bad reputation if you let the people all die out here. And so the Lord <laughs> repented of the evil he had intended. <laughs> and I tell you, if you talk about a mystery of prayer, that your prayers change anything, is how much of a partnership do we have with God that we can actually share with him what we feel and what we honestly think would be a good thing to do? I think we need to do that all the time, to think with God, what would be best for this kid? I'm praying for this kid, what would be good for his life. And I have some suggestions, Lord. Try them out. Martha did it bad way. She said, Lord, tell Mary to come in. No, no, don't do that. She should have been smarter. She should have said, Lord, have you ever thought about how Martha, Mary would benefit? Uh, fellowship with me in the kitchen. That would have been better. <laughs> Instead of saying, Lord, tell him. Tell her. And Jesus won't do it. So anyway... But, you know, if you can think with God, and that is the Hebrew word for intercession, pala, to think with God. And I think that promise our Lord is giving to the disciples. But then he also gives two signs of the proof from our side. And the first one, I've, I had trouble with it first. And I really, I had this, I thought about this. You know... I'm not sure when I read this text, because I was going to preach a sermon on this text, and I thought, I'm not sure, I, I don't know how I can handle this. You're my friends if you do what I command you. Is this the mafia? I begin to wonder, is it, it sounds almost that way. You're my friends if you do what I command. And I really was troubling with that until I looked at it as a poet, which should look at everything, in terms of the context of the entire uh, in uh, the entire paragraph. What is the command he's saying proves you're my friend? And now I've got a wonderful surprise for you. It's not the whole omnibus list of commands, like what your stand is on Sabbath, or what your stand is on women's rights, men's rights, or what your stand is on this or that, but uh, the big command Listen to it. It starts the, the paragraph and ends the paragraph. This is my commandment. Notice verse 12, that you love one another as I love you. And then notice how the paragraph ends. It ends, I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. There is one command that is dominating this paragraph. And it is the greatest commandment to love God and to love your neighbor. That's the big command. The others are secondary. All the rest hang on it, but that's the command. So he is saying, you prove you're my friend when you obey the great command. That proves you're my friend. And notice, it's, it's now it's not so much of a burden. It's knowing that... I'll give you a Luther. Luther handles a very tough text in Matthew, where our Lord teaches the Lord's Prayer. Because after he teaches the Lord's Prayer about where we are to ask God 
uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, that's a prayer. And after that prayer, Martin Luther notices that our Lord then ends with a warning. If you don't forgive the trespasses of your neighbor, then be careful. You may not get your own sins for, forgiven. And that's not exactly what Jesus says, but it almost sounds a little bit like that. And then Luther, in his commentary in Matthew, says that what Jesus is doing with the warning is the warning is meant to assure us of our salvation. You know you're saved when you're able to love the love that you got. When that love flows through you, you prove that you have it. So you prove you're redeemed when you're able to love with the love that redeemed you. Does that make sense? Beloved, let us love one another. It's when that love flows through you that you prove that you have it. And that's Luther's handling of that problematic text in Matthew. Uh, the warning about be sure you forgive sins of others is a warning that is a warning, as according to Martin Luther, it's a warning to assure us of our own salvation. We know that we're forgiven when we're able to forgive others, when we're able to share that love with others. Have you ever, have, have you ever been th uh, through a, a great estate uh, w where you see great treasures in an estate and... Uh, uh, and you see how beautiful something is. When I was a boy, uh, William Randolph Hearst's uh, uh, summer home was in McLeod. Near, did you know my hometown, five miles from, from Wintoon, which was the estate of William Randolph Hearst. And he would bring Marion Davies there and everything. And that's where, that was his estate, on the McLeod River. And it's the only property the Hearst family still owns. They, they gave San Simeon... Uh, to the uh, California State Parks. They kept Wintoon. And if you, saw, uh, if you saw Citizen Kane with Orson Welles, that great scene of the, uh, all the editors of the Hearst Empire, they're meeting in Wintoon, the castle up on the Cloud River. Because his mother, Phoebe Apperson Hearst, who built the Hearst Gymnasium for Women, built a, a castle there actually brought, bought it from Europe and brought it over and put it there on the McLeod River. Then it burned. Then they built another huge estate there in Wintoon. And I, I've been there because a friend of mine was working at the Hearst Castle, and I got a chance to go down and, and take a tour of it. And uh, I was once there at a, a high school party when Hearst brought in some of the kids there, so I saw Hearst himself. I'm still, I'm sitting there and in, when he was there. So uh, anyway, that's quite a... Uh, quite a treasure to see it, that place. And the, uh, imagine if I was being led through that estate by my friend who was working at the estate. And I, I'll make up some part now that's not true. And he takes you in the front door, but I did get to see the big building. And you walk in, and to the left is this huge, massive dining room with a huge table. Orson Welles did a good job with that in Citizen Kane. It's a big table uh, where all of the editors could sit in this great room massive door oh so beautiful just say oh isn't that beautiful and you're going ah oh. and then you walked into the lobby area and here imagine there was a little alabaster vase vase and it had one single daffodil in it for understatement right there in this great passageway right in the downstairs and then the stairway that would lead up to the hearse private quarters oh so amazing and you're just walking through it tapestries on the wall imported from europe Everything imported from Europe. What a place. And you're just standing there dazzled by it. And then the guy says to you, you know, you like all this stuff, don't you? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. I never saw anything so beautiful as that alabaster vase with the daffodil, single daffodil in it. That is, it's from Egypt. Oh, wow, it's so beautiful. And he said, you like it? I said, oh, yeah, it's just wonderful. Here, you can have it. I can have it? Yes, you just take it. Go ahead and take it. Now, uh, you see, because uh, Mr. Hurst would want me to give that to you. I, I know him very well. I'm his private assistant, and I want you to have it because I know he would be thrilled if you took that. So you take it. Now, I have to rule something out or it'll ruin my parable. And one is if the guy is a little bit demented and he's got confused. He's worked at the bank too long. He thinks the money is his or something like that. And, or else he's a thief. 
and wants you to take the alabaster vase out and get by the guards, because you can, you know, you're my guest, and then I'll come later and collect it and we'll sell it, because it's worth thousands, then that would ruin my parable. But if that's not true, then now let me ask you this big question. What has my friend just proved to you or to me when he said to me, take this alabaster vase? Mr. Hurst would want you to have it. He has proved that he is a friend of the owner. He was able to give away the best gift in the house. And I think that's what our Lord is saying in this great teaching on the Thursday night. He is saying, uh, you're my friends, you're my comrades. This is my command that you love others as I've loved you. You can give my love away. There's plenty of it. There's plenty to spare. That's what we need to know for that woman caught in adultery. That's what we need to know for people who are really in deep distress. There is plenty of love. And you have a right to give it. And when you give it away, you are obeying my command. Therefore, you can do it. See, the, Mr. Hurst said, by the way, if you see anybody come that wants that vase, go ahead and tell them to take it. I'd like him to, I want to get rid of it anyway. No, no, but I want to, you have a right to give it away. You've been commanded to give it away. We have been commanded to give away the love of Christ. And I just love that. And then finally, I think the final proof for us is that we are then invited to pray. And this time with, with a notice of joy. He says, uh, as a father has loved me, I, I love you. And I said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete, may be fulfilled. And you know, that's the final proof that we are to experience this and to experience this joy of fulfillment. Well, that's what happened uh, on the Thursday night uh, when our Lord gave the Lord's Supper to the disciples and then the arrest and the trial and the dreadful words from Pontius Pilate and then the cross, and we went through the seven words that Jesus spoke, including the mighty word finished. By the way, that word appears in the book of Revelation. The, you know the scene of the battle of Megiddo, which unfortunately my prophetic friends have made a huge uh, mistake and say, oh, that is, the, that is when Gog Magog happens and when the, the Russians invade China and we get a fulfillment of the... Uh, of the Israel promise, no, that's not. The battle of Armageddon, of the Armageddon battle that everybody is so fascinated with in the prophetic world is really what happened at the cross. Cross, the cross of Christ is the great Armageddon. It's the battle of Megiddo. By the way, Megiddo is the, a battle that Jews always lost. They lost every battle at Megiddo. And that becomes the symbol in the book of Revelation of the great battle when Jesus Christ died in our behalf. See, he didn't conquer in our behalf. He absorbed death and evil and the power of sin. And in that conquering, validated on Easter morning when, he, when death could not hold him. That's what happened at the cross. That is the battle of Armageddon. And isn't it interesting that in the battle of Armageddon scene in the book of Revelation, guess what word is spoken? Uh, when the great moment comes of the, of the dragon trying to kill the son of Mary and the word is used, finished. It's finished. It's complete. It's fulfilled. And that's what happened at the cross. And Jesus Christ uh, won. And then Easter morning. Now I want one, one last reflection drawing all these thoughts uh, and then we'll have a kind of uh, going to use the last few minutes for a give and take from you but th the last reflection is that when uh, when Easter happens uh, John makes it clear that uh, the disciples hear the words of Jesus appears to them in the upper room they are frightened and one of the disciples is not there and that's Thomas Thomas is uh, the twin, called the twin, and he's not there. And we're told that he says, unless I can see the nail scars in his hands and the, the pierced side, because I know he died, 
I will not believe. And so Thomas becomes the great doubter. But I want to make just a couple of key reflections on that doubt. He is doubting the witness of the disciples. And it seems to me the, the most doubts that people have with regard to Christian faith are doubts of our witness to it. And that's what he's doubting. He's doubting the witness of the disciples. Notice what Thomas is not doing. He is saying, I saw a man named Jesus of Nazareth. I came to love him. I followed him. And I know he died on the cross. And I know about the marks of that death. The spear that was thrust into his side and the nail scars on his hands. I know that. And I am sure of that. If that man is alive, I will believe but I cannot take a chance on anything else. And so in a sense, Thomas is saying, I can't take a chance on you having seen a hallucination or having seen something spiritual that has assured you of the wonderful, transcendent, spiritual, vague victory. I can't do that. If that man is alive, I can believe. Notice he doesn't say I won't believe. I can believe if that man is alive. Therefore, he says, I, unless I see the nail scars. By the way, one of my favorite American songwriters is Fanny Crosby. And Fanny Crosby was blind. And most of her songs, she has, has seeing references in her, blind, in her songs. But one of the most moving parts of many of her great songs is, I'll know my Savior when I feel his hands. Not see his hands, but feel his hands. I'll know my Savior. Because she was blind. And I know my Savior. I've got to have the concreteness of knowing that Savior is alive. I can't take a chance on a great mystical ghost. And so Thomas, in effect, is saying that, just like Fanny Crosby. I've got to be sure that that man is alive. And as you know, he, eight days later, he doesn't, he's not with the disciples for eight days. Those are eight tough days. But the disciples stay with him. They invite him back. I always say, if you have a doubter, uh, stick with your doubter. <laughs> Don't, right, don't, don't uh, drum him out. Hold on to your doubter. The story's not over. <laughs> I've said that to so many people about their children or about the children about their parents. The story's not over. It's not over. And so uh, they stay with Thomas. And then when our Lord appears the second time with the disciples, he says, Thomas, see my side and see my hands. Don't be uh, don't be with doubt. Don't continue to doubt, divide. Doubt, die, the word for doubt means to, to diacrino, to endlessly divide. Don't endlessly divide, but, 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 but see and be sure. And we don't have any record of Thomas coming up and touching the hand scars of Jesus. But we have the greatest confession of faith in all of the New Testament comes from Thomas. My Lord, my God. And then Jesus says to him, Thomas, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who don't see and will believe. Some people think he's scolding Thomas. He's not, in my opinion. What he is saying to Thomas is, Thomas, you have insisted. Now I'm going to give you a little theology now. Thomas has insisted that the Christ of faith and the and the and the Christ the faith and the Jesus of history have to be the same person. You can't have, and that was the big mistake that Bultmann made when he had an existentialized Christ, uh, so that the Easter faith was his hope. No, no, the Easter faith is hope because of Jesus of Nazareth. The Jesus of history, the Christ of faith are the same person. And Thomas is insisting on that. And so we who live now in 2018 have a great thankfulness in our hearts that at least one person in the apostolic band demanded to know that the Jesus of history that I knew died on the cross and the Christ of faith, they've got to be the same person. Now I can trust my resurrection. Now I can have hope in my future. He did it. Death could not hold him. And isn't that funny? That's the first message of St. Peter on the day of Pentecost. Death could not hold him. And therefore, we have hope. 
So Thomas is a great, great friend. Isn't it funny? The oldest Christian building in the whole world that we know of is a church of the Martoma Church in South India. And Thomas, the tradition of the church was he went to South India. And the Martoma Church, they're proud of the fact that they believe the oldest archaeological church site in the whole world of one building that was meant to be a Christian church is a church in South India. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful thing? Anybody who's against immigrants and are against immigrant faith should be very careful because that's, that's the first church, uh, the Martoma Church in South India. And of course, we're grateful for the great church in Rome too and the great church that all the great Protestant churches through the centuries that have grown. But the, the fact is, Thomas, doubting Thomas, uh, the story was not over, and he becomes the great comrade that assures us that the Christ of faith and the, and the Jesus of history are the same person. And that's the gift we get, and we get a, such a gift from John, John's gospel. The fact that John includes that scene as a very important scene in his narrative of the resurrection of Christ. Okay, now I'm going to stop because I want to give you a chance to maybe raise uh, questions and thoughts that you have, and then, uh, and then we'll draw it all to a close. But I want to give you some chance to ask some questions. I'll repeat any question that's asked so that it gets on the tape because they, they did tape us today too. Anybody have a question? Just speak up and then I'll, uh, I'll repeat it. Yes, hey, David. Yeah, he wants to know why, why the, th the, the third day or the first day of the week should be called. We, they call it both the third day, the third day, of course, of, after the uh, Good Friday, or the first day of the week when the Christians always worshipped on the first day of the week as the day of the resurrection. And why it would be called Easter. You know, I have an interesting ang angle on that. The early Christians being a, uh, you might say, a uh, outsider's, to the Roman world, and now they have faith. And they have to figure out when to have worship. And the most famous example is what, when can they have worship in the Roman world to honor Christmas? And so they choose the winter solstice holiday that the Romans, uh, and it was called Natus Est, but it was the the winter solstice holiday that the Romans had and they gave uh, workers a day off and the Christians decided to, to invade that winter solstice uh, Roman holiday which had its elaborate name and I, I'm sorry I can't re re remember it but it was something Natus Est and, uh, and the Christians worshipped there and and it became Christmas Day. And that is why November, De December 25th got chosen. Now, the Greek Orthodox, not so enslaved to Roman culture, decided to pick a different day for the celebration of Christmas. And they, and they used the lunar year, too, and did on the basis of another ma. And then, of course, the Jewish holiday, uh, like Passover and all, never ended up being... Uh, enslaved by Roman culture but it is true and I've always made a kind of a joke about that a good one I always said you know isn't it neat we uh, we had such a great holiday we just chose a uh, a random Roman day when they would let you have a day off work and we decided to celebrate the birth of Christ on that day and nobody could even think of the Roman holiday name I couldn't do it now and we, uh, our name won one out that we chose Christmas, the day to celebrate the Mass of Christ. And now the same thing with Easter. We're taking, again, like you say, we're taking a secularized day, which they're beginning to uh, uh, use, uh, and we're going to call it, it's going to be our celebration of joy day but it is, it's built on the Jewish calendar, though, not on the Roman calendar. 
Yeah, I don't even have anything else to say because I don't know it. I don't know of any other reason. But except that the early Christians did that. They, they didn't feel that was bad. Just go ahead and borrow a day that they're giving you a day off work and we'll, uh, we'll make it our holiday. Anybody? Now, I'm going to have to hear more about John the Baptist. What about John the Baptist? He's in prison. Oh, he's in prison, yes. And he tells his disciples to go check out Jesus. Yes. Is he the one? Do you think, well, what I've heard traditionally is that he was doubting if Jesus, his cousin, was the Christ? Yeah, okay, interesting. Now, I'm very interested in that. But what I'm wondering is, Yeah, very interesting. I, I, I love a, a line from Helmut Thielicke, who was one of my favorite theologians. And he said, John the Baptist should be seen the man of greatest faith in the New Testament and of greatest doubt. The reason he's greatest doubt is he knew the most. And when you know the most and you have doubt, it's more serious. He's the one who had pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He had seen the anointing from the, when, when he heard, I don't know if he, we don't know for sure that he heard the words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But he baptized Jesus and he's the one who said, no, I have no right to baptize you. And so he knew the most, he made the greatest claims. And then Tilika goes on to say, and he had the greatest and most substantial doubts. And notice his substantial doubt. John had promised that Jesus would uh, point out the evildoers. Remember, I even made a reference to that today, that in the book of Malachi, one of the proofs of Messiah is the Messiah will know the evildoers and will spot them. And if you look closely to uh, J um, the Gospel of Luke, when Luke narrates John the Baptist's message uh, in the opening of, of the Gospel of Luke, John's message is strictly that. He says with the many things he said, he, the, his winnowing fork is in his hand, referring to Jesus Christ. He will clear the threshing floor. The chaff he will throw into unquenchable fire. And then the grain he'll put in a wonderful place for fulfillment and blessing. But he's supposed to destroy the evil with unquenchable fire. And then John, and Luke even adds and says, and he says, and with other things, he preached good news. Well, good news, yeah, but not good news to the evildoers. They're going to be with unquenchable fire. They're going to be destroyed. And then he gets arrested for the most petty, trivial things. And then because Salome dances in front of Herod Antipas, and he's a very vain man, and she uh, won his attention. And then when he says, what can I give you? And then her evil mother says, uh, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so for that reason, Herod Antipas is going to have, he has the right of capital punishment, see? Caesar gave it to him. He's going to have John's head taken off. So John is now in prison before that happens. And I love it. He sends his servants up to Galilee and says, are you the Messiah? And this is one of the most poignant sentences there could be. Are you the Messiah or should I look for somebody else? That is profound doubt. But it comes from, it's very, it comes from a man who, who knew so much. And then the answer of our Lord is the part that makes that so moving. He then says to the disciples, when you went out into the woods, what did you expect to see? Just a, a reed blowing in the wind. No, I tell you, there is no greater prophet than the prophet John the Baptist. He pays tribute to him. And then he says, tell John, watch what I'm doing and tell him not to be offended. And then at that moment, he says, tell him that the poor have good news preached to them. The captives hear good news. Tell them that and tell him not to be offended. Notice how tender that is from Jesus. And of course, Jesus knows that he is going to 
he is going to have a far more, more profound uh, battle with evil, death, and the power of evil uh, at the cross. But there it is. So John, I've always felt, I agree with Telica, when John heard those words spoken to him as a great prophet, I believe he went to death feeling aff affirmed and his doubts answered. But he is the greatest doubter and the greatest believer in the New Testament is John the Baptist. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's so profound. Yeah. The good shepherd is what? Yeah, it, when they are feeling very lonely or no? How, how you can... They're still in an ongoing abusive situation. Yeah, uh, uh, ongoing, yeah. One of the best promises we have is of the good shepherd. Who I like two things in that parable. He knows his sheep. And then it says a strange thing. His sheep recognize him. And you know, it is true. I watch people who are in doubt or in depression or in you kind of have to wait for them to recognize uh, that who he is. And all you can do is pray and do the best you can to model hope and, and say it as best you can. But you know, you have to wait it out. That's where I, I love to use my own sort of one thing I like to say is the story's not over. And the story's not over for that person right now. But right now they're in a very, maybe in a, in a, shadowy valley but the good shepherd is still one of the most marvelous of all the promises of Jesus and I, I just love that good shepherd image when he says no one can pluck them out of my hand and that means the shepherd is better than uh, the sheep's directional abilities he's able to find the lost sheep and of course he tells parables Jesus tells parables about this too but he's able to do it. And I think that's one thing you have to pray. If you see somebody who looks like they're a lost person, you know, and lostness is there, uh, pray that, that they'll be found. And pray this prayer. <laughs> I pray this for my kids, all they're growing up, and my grandkids now. I pray for this all the time. Lord, bring good people into his life. Bring good people. That's not asking God to tamper with anything. I'm not saying, Lord, make him good. No. What are you going to do? Are you going to ask the Lord to take away his freedom? He's not going to take his freedom away. But you can pray, Lord, bring good people into their life that they can see what it means that a shepherd is able to, to find them. Because very often, the person that is lost or feels lost they get their first finding from one of the sub-shepherds. In other words, just an ordinary Christian. An ordinary Christian often gets to play that role of finding you and taking you seriously and not writing you off. And uh, I look at C.S. Lewis's journey of, uh, in his own journey of faith in Surprised by Joy, and you look closely in Surprised by Joy and see the role that key people played in helping him to discover the reality of Christ's love. Uh, one was his officer in, in France during the Battle of Somme. He saw that officer killed right in front of his eyes. He said, as a man named Johnson, we would have been lifelong friends. He was also from Oxford, just a year ahead of me in school. And he was my captain. He was, Lewis was second lieutenant. I saw him killed right in front of me. He never forgot that. But yet that man, that officer, he said he had the same kind of intellect as W.T. Kirkpatrick. And he was on his way toward faith. And, he, and then, of course, G.K. Chesterton, uh, when he said, I saw goodness in him, it pulled me in. And then the great poet who lived 300 years earlier, George Herbert, I read the, he said, when I read George Herbert, I realized there's a man who understood human beings. He understood me. So in a way, I look at people like that and see how they, how they find their way back. And often the Lord uses uh, sub, uh, you know, sub shepherds who are just ordinary Christians who get to play that kind of role.
That's why never write anybody off and never stop uh, praying, you know, and, and thankfully that the story's not over and things are happening. I, I've, you know, I've had some wonderful experiences as a pastor to see that lived out. People who I, can I tell you one a true story that right, happened right here in this church? When I was the youth pastor in Seattle, I had a young man who was vice president of my youth group. I can even tell you his name. He wouldn't mind, I guess. Well, anyway, Champ Heilman. But he was one of my guys. And then one day he came to me and said, you know, Earl, I don't believe this anymore. <laughs> and so he quit my youth group. You know, that's very disruptive to have the vice president of your youth group quit. And he quit right in the mid-year. And then he says, I don't think I'll come anymore because I just don't, I just, I don't know. It's just not working. And then I, I didn't see him again forever. It seemed like, and then one Sunday in this church, he was sitting here, and he with his wife, that he had gone on to get a PhD in history, and he was there with his wife, and he came up to me, and he says, "Do you know who I am?" I says, "Yeah, I know who you are. Believe me, you don't forget these unhappy stories in your ministry." <laughs> The guy who dismantled my whole ministry as a youth pastor. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. Forget, I know who you are. And he said, "You know, Earl, I have to tell you that if I when I got if I if I got rid of Jesus Christ as an idea, he haunted me as a person. When I got rid of him as a person, he haunted me as an idea. I couldn't get him out of my mind. And then I met this girl when he was going to college. She was a Christian. He came back to Christ." And, he, and, they, and they decided to find me up here and go to church and, and let me. So, hey, the story, what, story's not over. It's not over. Yeah. So, Earl, um, if I'm correct, you believe that John had read the rest of the Gospel. Yeah. Gospel. That's my view. Yeah, the kingdom fascination that is true in the earlier gospel, especially like in Matthew, which is very Jewish-oriented, because by the time of the first century, the Davidic side of the yearning, of those great historic yearnings, if, if Abrahamic is the identity, and Moses is the redemption, uh, David is definitely the fulfillment, and that's kingdom. In fact, the Pharisees actually had a statement in the, in the first century, that there is no valid prayer that doesn't pray for the kingdom of God. And our Lord obeyed that. Notice when he taught his prayer. Here's how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingly, thy kingdom come. Now, Bonhoeffer says, but you got to understand the way Jesus is using the word kingdom. It means kingly reign. It doesn't mean territory. Now, the Jews, I think, did think territory. And unfortunately, the prophetic movements that have dominated so much of Christian thought have thought kingdom in territorial terms. And that can be very, very bad. And that can cause you to want to build walls or to destroy walls to have your kingdom win and, and, and get power. And it's no question about after suffering as much as they did under the Roman, the Roman uh, tyranny, that they would want kingdom. And by the way, it's going to take a long time to get the Roman tyranny over, and then it'll be substituted with another tyranny and another tyranny and another tyranny. But it, it is true. Kingdom was a big, uh, a big thought. But I like Bonhoeffer's handling of it, that the way we should read kingdom is kingly reign. It's the kingly reign, it's, and that's, that has freedom in it, it has grace in it, and it has, uh, it's what Jesus does with the woman caught in adultery. It is true that John would prefer to use the word joy and fulfillment language rather than kingdom language than the other gospels use kingdom language more. But they're all the same, I think. I don't see them as in, 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 at war with each other at all.
Yeah, the kingdom of God here, and then of course the ultimate fulfillment, ultimate kingdom fulfillment, is again kingly reign, fellowship. I like John's emphasis on fellowship. Uh, with uh, notice in that section I just did from the Thursday night discourse, that's all relational language. And but you get it also in the Gospels. It's relational language too in Matthew and like the. the parable of all day workers is very relational but yet you're right there is a fascination with kingdom because of the davidic thread that is the davidic thread in the in the yearnings yeah they're, and they're very they're very deep very deep yearnings yeah Yeah, where Jesus in John, he makes a big point of uh, my father, but he does it also in, in in Matthew. Remember when the when the the mother of James and John want to, their boys to be in the right and left, he said, "Oh, that's my father's decision." <laughs> now you might say, "Oh, he's uh, shoving it away," but that's my father's decision. But now you, uh, then he goes and gives this wonderful teaching on servanthood being servants before the Lord. Uh, no, he, he does. He honors his father and uh, prays to his father. There's a mystery. The, uh, let, let's give a little bit of heavy theology. The, uh, Multmann helps us a lot with this, too, in understanding the nature of God. The nature of God is triune. And we, by that, we don't mean three gods. We mean that there is a mystery of fellowship within the very essence of God. And that is a genuine mystery. How can there be fellowship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Jesus prays to his Father. He is comforted by the Holy Spirit. Now, they're, they're the three, there are three uh, parts of the one whole. And yet, within, now this is, this is a mystery. Within the essence of God, there is fellowship. Do you know that we have no human Example of this, except maybe schizophrenia or something where a person has split personality and has two people in their own personality. And so we would call that, we would call that psychosis. But in the essence of God, there is fellowship. So that God has... The, otherwise, now, here's the part that Mootman helped me with. Otherwise, how can you talk about God having love? Love comes out of, uh, uh, out of his own consciousness of awareness of love. There is love within the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And to me, that is a genuine mystery. And it, it makes the prayers of Jesus meaningful. And you can pray uh, to, uh, uh, to the Father, you can pray to the Son, because the Son prays to the Father. And the Holy Spirit assures us of the Son's relationship with the Father and with us. So... You get all those working together to, to make a, a wholeness. A little louder for me. Yeah. Yes, and that unity with the Father should uh, discipline us from some kinds of uh, doctrines that begin to, to treat uh, the sacrifice of our Lord as if there is uh, the merciless Father ex a, 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 a causing suffering to his Son uh, in our behalf. But, but no, it's, it, it's, he's causing suffering to himself. He himself is suffering in our behalf. And notice in the, John's makes that pretty clear that the beginning, in the beginning was the, the word, logos. The word is with God. The word was God. All things were made through him. So now Jesus is a part of creation, is the Lord of creation too. And then the Lord of, of, of sacrifice. In him, uh, all these things happen in our behalf. So you don't want... 
to create a kind of a doctrine where you have the brutal father. And I, I know sometimes uh, pastors have done that, uh, but it, it, maybe to try to be more dramatic, but I don't think it's biblically true. Uh, all the things you say about uh, the suffering of Christ is the suffering of his father as well. And the, even the cry for help, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is the psalm that ends with hope. Even that psalm ends with hope. It doesn't end in despair. It is not a despair psalm. But he does roar. He says he roars for help. And, and he does pray in the Garden of Gethsemane to his father and says, can this be passed? Or do I have to take it? And so there is the mystery of the fellowship within the Godhead. And I like to leave it there as a mystery, a genuine mystery. Yes, right here. Maybe I'm going to... Okay, go ahead. Uh, when uh, Jesus is talking to Philip, he's uh, saying to Philip that there are going to be greater things that you will do than I have done. The question is, what are those things that uh, he's referring to? And then he goes on to say, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it. Yeah. And uh, what exactly is Jesus? Yeah. You know, you have to do a little definition, a little defining of greater. Greater things, you'll do greater things. Uh, it's better to see it in terms of space. You'll do wider things. I mean, now it, it, these things are all, and he makes the same sort of promise really in the, in the final commissions, the great commission. The, it's all happening here in this great moment. And it is a, it's a small moment in a sense. It's one man, you know, and... Uh, in these, this little group of, of disciples, and yet they're going to have greater things are going to happen. Wider. I think, see it wider. Not greater in, of greater significance, but wider. It's, if you think this is happening now, it's going to happen wider. It's going to spread. I, I kind of think of it that way. And that is more helpful to me than trying to uh, parse the word greater as if it was greater in value. Nothing is greater in value than uh, the sacrifice in our behalf by God himself when he takes upon himself our, uh, our, our tragedy and also our, our joys and, and fulfills our joys, fulfills us. And uh, that... How does, uh, how does unanswered prayers fit in with what Jesus Yeah. Yeah, unanswered prayer. Sometimes, sometimes when we pray we do get an answer that's no. And I think that is what happened to Martha when she said, uh, make Mary go into the kitchen. He said, no, Martha, Martha, you are, you are, notice he does pastorally help her. You are anxious over many things, Martha. Okay, good. That, that puts her at, at, at full, it, it, it resolves in a way. That is not your, is, you're in, you're in the, Service, not management. So don't be in management, you know. And Mary is, uh, is made a choice, and it's not going to be taken away from her. That's hers. You know, isn't that a beautiful pre preservation of your freedom? That's important in knowing how to relate to your children. Don't try to take away their freedom. Uh, don't, don't try to get compliance from someone uh, as if that were a great victory. Compliance it may not be a victory at all. In fact, here's a great Luther quote. Men and women who are converted because of fear will later hate their conversion. Uh, so sometimes compliance can happen because you're powerful. But it's not a, not a great victory. Uh, you know, it, because they'll hate it later. So it's better to take your time and do your best to model uh, grace and, and then to trust grace to make its, its full mark. I, and I think, again, that's Johannine. That's very John. Yes, go ahead, Rick. Um, is Thomas the disciple that you were referring to, the same disciple as the disciple that Jesus loved? No, that's John. I think the disciple that Jesus loved, that reference... I would rather translate it always that he is the younger, likable one. That's the way in the first century that 
use of uh, phileo would be used for a, a boy. He is considered, uh, uh, you know, younger. Because you don't talk about an old man being likable. Uh, you, you talk about <laughs> old men being uh, wise. And uh, you think of old men being wise, maybe, and not troublesome. Not, uh, you know, not obstructionist. Remember uh, Parkinson's law? We don't want obstructionists when you get old. But on the other hand, they may not be as likable because they've got, they're a little cranky and stuff. And, and that, that's like Puddle Glum. You would never say Puddle Glum is likable, but I'll tell you, he is a great guy. And uh, you're gra- finally at the end, you're saying, let's hear a cheer for Puddle Glum because uh, Lewis got a, got a hold of something really great there when he made that guy it's such a key figure in, in Silver Chair, Puddle Glum. Yes. Oh, the post, the post, uh, the postscript. Yeah, uh, John 21. I love it as a great. It's a great text because it, what what do I love about it? I love the fact that Tom, P, uh, Peter has been forgiven for his betrayal, but he can't get over it, and so he's going into depression. And so Peter says, "I'm going fishing." That's one thing he knows is fishing, and I love that. If you're depressed, do something you like that you do well. Forget all this religious stuff. Do something you like. And because you already failed in all the religious stuff. I mean, he failed, even with his sword, he failed by chopping the wrong guy's ear off. And the guy he chopped the ear off of was a perfectly innocent guy, just standing there holding a lantern. So, you know, be careful. <laughs> and uh, fanaticism has never been a good blessing. And so, uh, so he's a depressed young, and he says, I'm going fishing. And then comes a beautiful sentence. The other disciples say, we're going with you. <laughs> and it includes Thomas. They were all going to go, we're going to go with you. So they go up to Galilee, and then comes the beautiful part. Jesus shows up, and he's there at the beach. And then he says something. It's not a miracle at all. It's just one guy on the beach telling something to fishermen who are out in the water where there are shadows where the, where the fish are. And he says, put your net on the other side. I think you'll get some fish. Now, don't say, oh, what a great miracle that he... No, he didn't do it. He just saw some fish there. At least that's the way. Take the leaner interpretation, always, <laughs> and you have the better theology. And they catch... But then notice, again, John's attention to detail, 153 fish. They counted them. It was such a great haul. And they come in, and then, and of course, typical of Peter, he lets the boys bring a fish in. He runs in. And then comes this incredible encounter. But the best part of the encounter was three times. Remember, Peter denied him three times. And that, that, I'm not a great numerologist. Beware of numerology. Do not do any theology on the basis of numbers. But he did deny Christ three times. And our Lord made a big point of that. And it's, I don't think it's strange. But Jesus three times says, Peter, do you love me? Not did you love me. Wouldn't that be horrible? Did you love me? Well, what kind of love was that in the garden? <laughs> no, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. Do you love me? In fact, he even changes words at once because Peter keeps saying yes, f- using filio, not agape. And then finally, so Jesus says, okay, I'll, I'll settle for filio too. Do you love me? Filio. Which means like. Do you like me? And then, he, and then Jesus says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Present tense. Feed my sheep. And I love to say that Jesus takes this young man and brings him through the journey of his failures without any uh, rehearsal of what they are, Uh, but just takes him through them and then says, uh, feed my sheep, gives him a job to do. And then a beautiful thing happens. Then uh, Peter, being the leader, springs into action as a leader again. And then he sees John, the young John. Remember, he's still the youngest. And he said, and what about him? Uh, and then Jesus says, Peter, you follow me. Uh, don't, I'll worry about him. You know, it's almost, remember in the, uh, C.S. Lewis has that in the, in the Horse and His Boy. Uh, Shasta says to Aslan, 
Did you scratch Eris' back? Because he did scratch Eris' back. Because he wanted her to feel what the maid felt when she was beaten up for having let her get away. And so he said, did you scratch her back? And then, and since Aslan always tells the truth, he says, yes, I did. And then Shasta says to him, now being the leader again, why did you do that? And then comes, Lewis gives one of the greatest answers, and it's right from John. It's right from John 21. He said, I tell no one anyone's story but their own. I tell no one, anyone's story but their own. And that's exactly, I, Lewis got that from John 21. He said, what about John? And, and Peter says, and he says, Peter, don't worry about him, you follow me. And then John, being the great commenter he is, says, there was a false superstition that went about that I would live forever. It's not true. And it started from that maybe. So John wants to clear the air. And that's neat. It's neat, too. So that, that's the end of the book. And then the book's all over. But I just thought it was interesting, isn't it, that Peter is restored. And John, who... I honor, I honor John for this because his great rival was Peter. Remember, his mother helped to make that bad. But that's his rival, is Peter. And Jesus uh, and John clearly narrates the passage that puts Peter in charge of the disciples again. No question about it. Peter is the man. And John, we owe it to John. It's, you wouldn't expect it because you wouldn't expect John to do that, but he does because he's, a, he's an honest narrator. See, again, when you get these narrations of John, you have a hard time saying that you got a phony here. He isn't a phony you know, you talk about fake news. He's not building the news around his message. The news is there because it's news. And he narrates it honestly. This is what happened. And in fact, when Peter <laughs> began to ask about me, the Lord just cut it off. And so I'm glad that there isn't some me message going around that I'm going to live forever. I don't want that. I'd hate to have to cope with that. Hey, Thank you for coming today. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Earl. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being wise and likable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even though I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> And for giving us solid food. Oh, hey, thanks. And let me, let me just say a prayer in closing. Oh, God, thank you for this time to remember your grace, your great gift of life and love and suffering and joy, and the adventure into which you have invited us. And we pray your blessings on Earl as he continues to invite people into that great adventure. We thank you for these many blessings and tender mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I, I do want to say my wife, Shirley, sends her greeting. Uh, she uh, was here with me for the, uh, the uh, emeritus event, and, and she's coming down for the uh, Craig Barnes uh, lecture, but she just couldn't come uh, these two weekends in a row practically because we're being very, very busy as grandparents right now. And in fact, we're going back, and uh, my daughter Liz, uh, who's the head of drama at, the, at Stadium High School in Tacoma, her actors are putting on eight performances of Guys and Dolls, and Shirley and I will see the first and the last. We try to go all of them, but we can't go to every one. We're going to go to the first and last, always the opening night and the closing night. And so we got that, and uh, Shirley has been very busy on that. And, and we're just uh, grateful for uh, this church. It's been such a great anchor in our lives and uh, for you. So thank you. And, and New College, it's just a joy to be able to be at New College and uh, do it every year. So God bless you.